Competitions, uh, which were uh, effectively uh, outlawed beginning July 1 this year, so that there would be no ability to have those shooting contests anymore. The S, uh, there was one other bill that Senator Rogers introduced, S3, that we're not taking up, and that would have repealed the current law regarding the high capacity magazines. And the reason we're not taking that up is because that's currently under litigation. And frankly, I don't feel that our committee should be involved in something when there is current litigation going on regarding that issue. Uh, then we're taking up S-22, which was introduced by Senator Baruth. And that bill has to do with a waiting period before someone can purchase a firearm and safe storage of firearms. We're not taking up another bill that was introduced by Senator Baruth that has to do with um, printing. Frankly, I don't know how you do it because I'm not that technology. Uh, but it has to do with uh, the ability to um, manufacture firearms from a computer printing of the firearms. And that is under some federal lit litigation right now. And, uh, there has been an injunction issued against at least one manufacturer, if that's what you call it. And then finally, we're taking up S-72, which deals, is a inter bill introduced by uh, myself, and that deals with the uh, extreme risk protection orders or red flag laws that we passed last year. It does two things. One thing it does is allows for an exemption <coughs> from HIPAA for medical professionals who contact law enforcement about someone who they believe is a risk to themselves or others. Um, to, and I will remind you that that bill not only dealt with firearms, but also explosives. So if somebody had dynamite or hand grenade or whatever, so that's not just reserved to firearms. That's one part of it. The second part of it, as many of you know, there's no ability to study the impact of firearms on a national basis. This Congress has basically outlawed that funding. So this bill would allow emergency room doctors basically from around the country who have banded together to study these laws in various states um, to use this information from both the Department of Health and um, the uh, uh, Court Administration. Pardon me? Court administrator. Court administrators, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Court administrator's <coughs> office to begin a national study of the effectiveness or non-effectiveness of these laws. So that's basically what we're um, dealing with. And uh, we appreciate the uh, people's interest. We will be holding a public hearing at Vermont Technical College on Tuesday, March 12th, yeah. from 5.30 to 7.30. Um, and we're doing it outside the state house because people are sick of going to the well of the house. And uh, quite frankly, it's, um, we felt it was more accessible. Well, I, I think most of the committee would prefer to do it 
<coughs> public hearing south of Route 4. That's difficult this time of year. At least uh, Randolph is right off the interstate. It's available to people from both the north and south and more accessible than Montpelier for a lot of our constituents who Senator White and I coming, and Senator Nick are coming from the southern part of the state. So uh, that's our plan. We will then uh, deal with the bills uh, after the town meeting break. But that's the public hearing, and we invite anybody to come, sign up. But obviously, we're not going to hear from everybody that night. But if people want to be part of the record, they can send an email to myself or to Peggy Delaney, the committee uh, assistant uh, with their thoughts. It'll be entered as part of the committee record. Uh, not necessarily posted on the website, but at least uh, your thoughts would be part of the record on any of these bills, whether you support them, against them, whatever. So with that, um, I would, our first witness is uh, Rod Black. And, uh, Mr. Black, if you're welcome. Oh, I should have been. Uh, we'll introduce you to when you get up. Um, and thank you for being here, and I know this was a very difficult time. Thank you for having us. Maybe something to get you started. Um, uh, uh, Phil Rue from Chittenden County. Dick Sears from Bennington County, and also represent the town of Wilmington. Joe Bennington County. Jeanette White from Wyndham Senate District. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Alyssa Black. My name is Rob Black. Um, we are here to support uh, the passage of the gun pulling off period, waiting period. Um, you may want to use that like, the smaller microphone. Not that. Not that one. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it'll be picked up easier. Pull it right to you. That'll make it easier. Okay. Um, we feel that if this law was in place right now, that our son Andrew would still be alive today. Um, I was born in Burlington, born and raised in, in Burlington. Um, I went to Burlington High School and Champlain College. Uh, my great grandfather was actually the Secretary of State years ago. Um, I'm a combat military veteran, and I served in the military for seven years, came home to work in the family business, uh, and continue to do so today. Um, I am a gun owner, uh, and, and I, I am a Second Amendment supporter, um, but, I, but I do feel that a, a waiting period needs to be in, in place. Again, my name is Alyssa. So I'm from Western New York originally. I met Rob when Rob was in the military. Uh, I met him in January. We got married in July. We've been married for 31 years. Um, we moved back to Vermont when Rob got out of the military. And eventually we ended up having three children when I was nine months pregnant with our youngest child, Andrew. We moved to Essex. We moved there because it had good schools and it was in easy, relatively easy commuting distance for both of us. Um, I currently work, and I've worked for 22 years at a um, family practice in Williston, Vermont. So Andrew was our third child. We have three children, 28, 24, almost 25, and Andrew was 23. Um, he was a happy kid. He was a healthy kid. Um, <coughs> grew up, he was involved in sports. He was active with friends. He did really well in school until he had some struggles in his final years trying to maintain his interest, but he graduated from Essex High School. Um, I guess it's been about four, four years ago he graduated from high school. He was funny. He was incredibly bright. 
he, it was hard to hold Andrew's interest. One of the things, you know, that played into a little of this is that Andrew was actually kind of an impulsive kid. Like a lot of kids are impulsive. You know, he would start a sport and he would play a sport for a year, two years, be really, really good at it, and then all of a sudden, he would up and decide, I think I'm gonna do lacrosse now. <laughs> I think I wanna do skateboarding now. And he would just change on a limb. It was very difficult to capture his interest, his final two years of high school. Andrew was one of these kids where if you wanted him to learn something, he was gonna find something else that he wanted to learn. Um, you know, I've gone through his rooms, his room. He had notebooks. He used to keep notebooks on everything. Andrew, I think it was his junior year of high school, I think they were reading Animal Farm. I'm pretty sure it was Animal Farm. And he was captivated by, you know, the whole Russian thing around it. Andrew started skipping English class. He was teaching himself Russian. I have notebooks filled with him teaching himself Russian. And he couldn't speak it, but he could translate it and he could write it. He spent years doing that. Um, he was, <laughs> he liked chemistry and I was kind of desperate I mean, he was about 16 years old, and I, I just needed something to capture this kid's attention, something to show him that all these things that they're trying to teach you in school actually have real-life practicalities. And Andrew being Andrew, I thought, okay, I'm going to buy him a homebrew kit. I want you to know, I actually researched the laws behind it, and there is no law in the state of Vermont it says that you cannot brew, a 16-year-old cannot brew in your own home. He was not allowed to sell it, he was not allowed to distribute it, but he was allowed to brew it, or at least my reading of the law, and I'm not a lawyer. Um, he was captivated by it. He absolutely was captivated, and he was really good at it. He would do these extravagant recipes, and you know, if something just didn't work out quite right, he would have all these long notes on, you know, the boil should be longer, or add calcium carbonate, or change the hop on it. And then he would rework it, and he would do it again. And he spent years brewing beer. <coughs> and it's the one thing that we got Andrew interested in. And it's the one thing he held on to. He never left that. It was his dream to work in not just a brewery. It was his dream to work in one of the big breweries. He worked at um, Essex Discount Beverage, which is our local um, liquor store, <coughs> convenience store. Andrew worked for years. Even at to know what they should buy. Andrew could have a 45 minute conversation with you about, well tell me what you like, what you've had before, and I'll lead you in the direction you need to go. And he was holding out for a job with one of the big guys. He wanted to work at The Alchemist, he wanted to work at Hill, or he wanted to work at Boston's. And we kept trying to get him to, yeah. to, to jump onto one of the smaller ones yeah. to start. And, just start. Just and uh, he, 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 hit him him and he was going to hold out for the big one, and he, he finally got it. He finally got his job at Lawson's. Uh, so we went for an interview in August at Lawson's, and they hired him the same day. Uh, and I noticed they hired an awful lot of people. Most of the people had to do second interviews. Andrew was hired the same day talked to Karen Lawson. She said he went out of that interview and they all looked at each other and said, we want him. 
So, Andrew had challenges in his, in his life, but it wasn't anything unusual. It wasn't anything that a lot of young kids, young men in particular, have. Andrew was not mentally ill. He did not have a diagnosable mental illness. Um, he was just your typical kid. We do, we keep calling him a kid. He was, he was a young man. And he was just the typical young man who was finding his way. And he was making his way. So he got this job. He'd, had, he'd been working for seven years at Essex Discount Beverage. He got the job at Lawson's. And he was so excited. And the Lawson's, of course, is up in Waitsfield, and we live in Essex. And he was making that drive every single day. And he loved driving there. He loved driving home. He loved being there. Um, you know, this was his dream come true. At the same time, <coughs> um, Andrew also had been in a long-term relationship for two and a half years with somebody he loved very, very much. At the time he got his job, he also felt it was time to end this relationship. Although he loved her, it was clear that it wasn't going to work and it wasn't going to be sustainable. And so he had broken up with her at the end of September. <laughs> he was moving out. He had gotten an apartment in Waterbury, and he was going to be moving into that on January 1st. Um, the morning that Andrew died, he actually received his final. He'd been going through um, applications and being accepted for this apartment. He actually got the email confirming that the apartment would be his. He'd also been um, saving up his money because he needed first and last and deposit for this new apartment. So he actually did have, um, he had saved a couple thousand dollars for this apartment. Um, I'm sorry. So the, I think the important thing that I want to say is that Andrew was, he was making these concrete steps towards his future. And they were all these positive steps. Unfortunately, I think, and I know I didn't think about this. Because I was looking at him from a mother. I wasn't looking at him as a 23-year-old man. He also had, in these last two months, he'd had a lot of loss. He'd left his job where he'd been working for seven years with all the social interaction <coughs> with the people that he knew and loved from there. He ended this relationship and you know the whole social circle that goes along with a relationship. When you're in a relationship for two and a half years, the two of you have activities and people that you live together. And when he ended the relationship, that sort of ended for him. So I do know that in the last two months or so, he had been lonely, a little bit lonely. I also know that he was making positive steps to reconnect with past friends. Um, you know, we obviously have this phone and everything is social now. He had actually even reached out to an old friend who was a girl and they have been having just a completely innocent conversation right up until um, Tuesday, December 4th. Um, kind of making plans of, well, what are you up to now, and where are you, and maybe we should get together, or something like that. 
he was making new friends at his work. But he also had a, a lot of loss. Like anybody who's making a change in their life would have that sort of loss. Um, so we know exactly what happened with Andrew. We know what was going on in his mind at the time. Um, he left us 40 hours of conversation and explaining exactly why he was doing what he was doing. And also, you can watch his mind kind of delve into this sort of self-hatred depth. And he just couldn't get out of it. He couldn't get out of it. Um, we don't really want to give the details about uh, the triggering event, not because we don't want to be honest about Andrew, but we're actually trying to protect other people. Um, so what happened was he got home on Tuesday, December 4th. He got home from work at about 8.30. And he came in and he ate dinner. And we watched the hockey game, which we always did. Yeah. Canadians. Yeah. Went downstairs, watched the Canadians game. And right about at the end of the game, <coughs> he went back upstairs. He went up to his room. And this is when his 40 hours started. Um, it has to do with social media. Saw something on social media, and he just couldn't move past it. Um, he goes on in his messages. He starts out. He was up, he was angry. He was upset. you can see him turn the anger into himself. Just swallow it. And you can see this confident young man just start this self-hatred. I'm not good enough. Nobody will ever love me. I'm ugly. Andrew was anything but ugly. <laughs> I know I'm his mom, but he was anything but ugly. <coughs> How he'll never find love. How he wasn't worthy of love. I had um, I have a friend who's a psychiatrist. He sat with me um, for several hours. We went through all of these messages. And he looks at me at the end and he says, you know, Alyssa, clinically, I wouldn't even be able to diagnose your son with depression. He says, your son had an acute adjustment reaction. A overwhelming reaction to an, a disappointing event in life. That's what he had. And he, couldn't make his way out of it. Unfortunately, when he got home on Tuesday night, he had Wednesday off and Thursday off of work. He always had two consecutive days off of work during the week. We weren't home, we were at work. Andrew spent two days basically alone, other than Wednesday night. And it was kind of like the perfect storm. I mean, everything came together, the social media, the, the two days off. Um, and, and that Thursday morning, he, he got up and, and we kind of know the steps he took from <coughs> the phone messages and, and receipts and everything. We know he went down to the beverage place where he worked and he filled his car up with gas that morning. He, he got a turkey sandwich. and. He talked to the people at, he would go in there and get his coffee in the morning, and he talked to them about 
what he was going to do that night. He had plans that night to go out with our daughter and our other son and our niece. They were all meeting at 5 o'clock that night. And he was telling them, this is what I'm doing today. And he had the day off. And we, we, we know that he went in to the gun shop and they ran a background check on him at 11.02 Thursday morning, December 6th. Um, we know he was out of the store with a firearm at 11.30. And, and, and we know he was dead before 4 o'clock that afternoon. Andrew had this path that he was taking that day that looked normal to everybody else. He, like I said, he went to Essex Discount Beverage. He got his coffee. He spent time with them, talked to them. He got himself his lunch. He bought a Pepsi. It was in my fridge when I got home. <coughs> he went to the store. He bought this gun. Filled his tank with gas. He came home and he logged into his Xbox on Netflix and watched two episodes of Mad Men. He'd been binge watching Mad Men for the last couple weeks. I mean, just regular everyday things. He did his laundry. Andrew has a collection of darn tough socks that he refused to dry. And that night, I go upstairs and there are all of his wet socks hanging on the towel rack in the bathroom. He did his laundry and he hung up his socks because he wanted to save them because he cared about them so much he didn't want to ruin them. He was never going to wear them again, but he hung them up to dry. He ate a turkey sandwich. First thing I did, open up the garbage can, and there's his turkey sandwich, happy. Just a regular day. About, look. Oh. And, and, and reading through his, his phone messages when you get to the last day. Um, it's so calm. You, you, can almost, you can almost feel by reading the, the messages, the, the doubt he had about what he was getting ready to do. Um, it, he, at the beginning of this, of these messages, he set a countdown. And he kept counting down. And he started his countdown at 36 hours. And then every once in a while, he would come on with 19 hours, 15 hours. Andrew's 36 hours were up at 11 o'clock that morning. Andrew didn't kill himself at 11 o'clock that morning. He's got about two hours of messages in this time. And it was like he was, he was doubting it. He was trying to give himself more time. You could see him trying to get, give himself more time. And he talked about how scared he was. I'm so scared now. I can't breathe. I'm having a hard time breathing. I've never been so unsteady in my life. And, and it, was, it was getting later in the afternoon and Andrew knew what time we would be home, which was, would be within an hour or so. Um, and I think it was the third, third the last message he, he sent. Um, he sent, he sent a, a long message talking about how he had, uh, how he had doubt. He kept saying, a part of me thinks that I shouldn't do this, that I should <coughs> and get my apartment in Waterbury, and then things will maybe get better. But knowing what I know, I just can't see that happening. But then he kept trying to convince himself over and over again that he shouldn't do it. And then he said, the third to last message he sent, well, he said, do you want to see something? Question mark. And then he said, I did something today that I shouldn't have done. And now it's too late. And then the person he was messaging said that they were calling the police. And he sent a picture 
of the gun laying on his bed. And then he said goodbye. And that was it. <clears throat> and I can imagine what he did. The dog would have been in his room, because the dog was always with him. And if he was home, the dog was in the room. And he took the dog, and he put the dog out of his room. And he closed his door, and he locked it. Andrew never locked his door. And the whole time, he was, he was 15 feet away from, from guns that are, are locked up and secured, and he couldn't get to them. He was 15 feet away from from weapons that were, were secured and that have, have been there for, for years. He was running out of time. He knew the police were coming. He knew he had spent his rent money on this gun. He knew it was too late. He just was running out of time. And you can tell he didn't want to do it. But he did it because he'd set it in motion. Because he had said he was going to do it. And how could he go back on his word now? It started as a, I'm going to do this to hurt you. And it became over the 40 hours, I have to do it because I said I was going to do it. And what choice do I have now? If, if we, we would have just had a chance to get home that night um, and just some kind of interaction with other people, if he, if he would have gotten home and had dinner, if he would have gotten up and, and drove to work the next morning to Lawson's with, with the people that he loved, um, I mean, I, I, I know him. If he had gone out to, he was supposed to go out to dinner with Victoria and Stephen and Ashley. He basically he would have woken up and said, what, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? This is, this is stupid. And, and he wouldn't. So, do you believe that a waiting period would have allowed you Absolutely. to talk to him? Absolutely. You... It would have given him time to actually be out in public around people. It would have given his brain at least a, a, a time to say, because we knew he was coming out of where he had been, this dark hole he had put himself into. We could see him coming out of that. It would have given him time to come out of it. It was a fleeting, two-day-long self-pity fest, basically, is what Andrew got into. And he wasn't given the time to get out of it. And we firmly believe we absolutely believe if there had been a waiting period, he would not have done this. And I know that he wouldn't have done it because he said in his last message, I did something I shouldn't have done. But now it's too late. It's, it was too late. He'd already bought it. What was he going to do now? So <clears throat> since this happened, obviously, and we were really open about what happened, and that was important to us. It was very important to us that <clears throat> people knew how our son died. Honestly, we actually are armed with far more information today than the day we wrote that obituary. We didn't have these messages on that day. We were just shocked to learn. because The first thing the detective asked us, I remember him standing over our stairwell looking at us saying, well, where would he have gotten the gun? I, I, I don't know. He's like, did you ever see it in his room? And no. We, the, the thought that he had actually gone out and bought a gun that morning, it just, it, it, I couldn't even fathom it. We couldn't even contemplate that that something like that could happen. We learned the day we wrote the obituary was when the detective called us and said he bought it that morning. This is when the background check was. Later on, 
when some of the doctors from my practice I work out I work at came and removed Andrew's mattress from his room. We found a safe under his bed. We didn't even know he had a safe under there. And we had the key to it. It was on his keychain. And we opened it up and there is a perfectly folded receipt for eleven twenty six that morning. His credit card receipt. Thousand dollars he spent on this gun. And the bullets, the box of bullets, packed neatly in the back. The, the instruction manuals and the things that come with it, all neatly placed in the safe. Everything put away like it was for another day. And we've heard, we've heard from, from numerous people over the last three months from across the country, um, not, not just people. Uh, in Vermont with similar stories, eerily similar stories of, of suicides, of, of family members, of friends. Of, uh, it's, it's almost like they were telling Andrew's story. Yeah. I mean, this, this, you, you never knew, or I never knew, how, how many people suffer from the same thing. I would wake up every morning and there would be three new Facebook messenger messages that people had contacted me on Facebook. Oh my gosh, this is my son's story. My son was 19, my son was 23, my son was 21. Can you get specifically to how the waiting period, in your view, would have changed? Wow. We think. First of all, the only reason that anybody needs instant access to a gun is if they're going to hurt themselves or they're going to hurt somebody else. There may be well-intentioned reasons for hurting someone else, but ultimately, that's the only reason anybody needs a gun in 48 hours. We own guns. This is not a light purchase. You yeah, can. I, I think a, you respons think about a responsible it. gun owners do not go out and, and purchase firearms on an impulse. They, they plan the purchase. They, they know what they're purchasing it for. Um, and, and I think a waiting period if it would disrupt that impulsive purchase of a firearm. I mean, it would be a, it would be a nice little speed bump uh, for, for somebody that was buying it for the wrong reasons. A second part of this bill is safe storage. Um, and you obviously have safe storage in your home. Do you believe that that's a necessary part of this, or you don't care? Uh, no, you know. Well, I'm not going to speak about safe storage because I, I mean myself personally. If if you have children in your house, or you have other people in your house, and you're not storing your guns safely, I I, I don't have words for you. I'm sorry. I just don't. But the other thing about safe storage, which is important, a 48-hour waiting period, without that, it undoes your safe storage. All the things that people talk about to interrupt suicide, there's not time to get to it if you don't have a waiting period. I mean, I can only imagine countless, hundreds, thousands of people who know that somebody in their life is at risk and have taken their guns for them and stored them for them safely, away from them. I work in primary care. The first thing when somebody has suicidal ideation that our doctors talk about is, do you have firearms? Are they stored? And can you give them to somebody else to store for you? Well, what good does any of that preventive measure do if that person can just walk out and go buy another one? All the people trying to protect the people that they love doesn't do any good when the person can just buy another one. Um, 
Senator Bruce has a question. Mm -hmm. So thank you, first of all, for <coughs> coming. Um, I have daughters myself, um, and I've noticed the, one of the pieces of your story that resonates with me is <clears throat> I've seen it happen with my daughters where they're having a wonderful day. They go up to their room and they check into social media, and within seconds, their mood has crashed. They feel unattractive. Um, I was saying to Senator Nitka, there was a situation where my daughter found out on social media that an event was going on in real time that she had not been invited to with all of her closest friends. And she felt at that point like life was hopeless. Um, fortunately, she came downstairs. We cheered her up. But when you, it, it struck a chord with me when you said acute adjustment reaction. I think as a society with social media, we're creating more of those momentary reactions. And I'm wondering, I know you want to be sensitive to, uh, to other parties, but is there anything more you can say about that social media side of this? Did you ever notice that at other times with your son? Not with our son. No, not, um, not, not with Andrew. But talk it, about daughters. And <laughs> I mean, it, it was as simple as seeing a picture um, on social media that, 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 that put his <coughs> in a place where he could not get out of. I mean, it, it was that simple. Mm -hmm. And it was that fast. Um, <coughs> yeah, and Andrew actually was not a big social media person. I know that that's unusual <coughs> now. Um, what he saw, I had actually seen a couple days before. And I was just like, whatever. And so he had taken days to see that. That's how often he actually logged into his Facebook was days, <coughs> between days. Vermont, Vermont suicide, pro, I mean, Vermont firearm death problem is suicide, 90%. Roughly 90%, according to a study, uh, several studies of Vermont firearm related deaths are due to suicide. Um, so I think uh, last year when we were working on firearm related bills, that was strongly in our mind. I'm curious if there was any way that the gun shop owner had any idea that Andrew might have been contemplating that type of use of the firearm? Uh, no, he, he, he didn't. And for, we, we know that information firsthand. Um, um, yeah, I ran would, into him at the Price Chopper. If you wouldn't mind sharing that. I ran into him at the Price Chopper. Um, he's a really nice guy. The gun shop The gun shop owner. Um, we, we don't have any animosity against him. And we talked for a while. And you know, I he wasn't there, but the employee that sold Andrew the gun, um, you know, because the detectives had all gone in there, I believe the ATF actually had gone in also to make sure that everything had been done correctly, which it had been. <coughs> he said that Andrew was fine. And, and I don't have any doubts about that. Andrew was a confident young man. Yeah, he was well charming. Spoken, dressed well. That's what he said. He said he came in. And he was well dressed and was confident. He was laughing. He had a story behind why he was buying the gun, which was a completely legitimate reason that he <coughs> had been buying it. That there were absolutely no signs whatsoever. Um, he actually talked about um, another another family in the past that had questioned this and he gave me this the situation of you know that that person had come in and they had bought multiple types of rounds and because they were going to try things out and he says so you tell me what about that purchase how am i supposed to know that this person is going to kill themselves and he said there's no way we can know this and i don't blame He's not a psychiatrist, he's not a psychologist. He can't read the minds of the people who are coming in and the reasons that they're purchasing what they're purchasing. You don't go into a gun shop when you're suicidal. I would imagine, I never have, but you don't go in shaking and crying and you know, 
please sell me this gun so I can kill myself. Nobody does that. Other questions? Mr. Mr. <laughs> First, let me offer condolences. I think you're describing every parent's worst nightmare, and I don't think there's anybody here in the room that doesn't sympathize. You had described your being, um, in your words, in a dark hole. And I understand from your testimony today, as opposed to what I read previously, that you have now had access to social media and notes of events that have given you more information to learn about what was going on in his life at that time than you did initially when you first read the reports in the press about what had happened to you. Can you tell me what that dark hole period was that you recognized there was something going on with him? We didn't recognize anything was going on with him. We knew we'd gone into a dark hole because we read his messages after he was dead. When he was in our house, he was perfectly fine. Andrew and I made dinner together Wednesday night. <coughs> He's got messages, literally minutes, talking about how worthless he is. And then there's this 20 minute, 30 minute block of time where he was downstairs in the kitchen making spaghetti with me. And sat down and he had two big plates of spaghetti. And he went back upstairs and there's a message that says, I don't eat anymore, I haven't eaten in three days. <laughs> I mean, he was, we saw him Wednesday night. That was it. Wednesday night when we got home from work at 6 o'clock until he went to bed at 10 o'clock. Four hours. We saw him for four hours during this 40-hour stretch of time. I guess so the dark hole mm -hmm. is what we learned once we read his messages. Did you get a handle on how long that dark hole had been in place? Uh, it had started on Tuesday night. Tuesday night when he saw the picture. When he saw the picture. I, I wanted to um, also thank you. Your willingness to come forward, it's never easy. Um, and I can only imagine what you've <coughs> been going through. To be totally honest with everybody, uh, Senator Baruth and I met with the blacks uh, earlier in this session and had a wonderful conversation about this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think all of us on this committee offer our condolences for what you've been through, but also your bravery for coming forward and talking about what is, uh, Senator Benning aptly uh, noted, every parent's worst nightmare, and your willingness to talk about that in front of the monitors is uh, exemplary, and so thank you very much, and if that helps to heal it all, Hopefully. People keep talk, calling us brave. Well, we don't think we're brave. Well, we don't. We think we're doing this because it has to be I done. Older, I guess. And I, and it I, has and, to be done. You know, I, as a, you know, people think we're fairly thick-skinned as politicians, but we read social media too, and we read the comments after an article in the, whether it be the Bennington Banner or Vermont Digger or wherever it be, and you wonder, what the heck? What am I doing this for? I just stopped reading comments, but you know, others may still do that. Well, we're not, we're not totally naive. We understand that this isn't a cure-all um, solution for, for the problem, but it's, it's a pretty good speed bump um, to, to getting there. And in just a, a couple of days um, to, to give anyone a fighting chance, because once they have a gun in their hand, the fighting chance is over. This will not end. We are not naive. This is not going to end all suicide by firearm. We know that. But it could save some. Um, and if people could live our life for the last three months and the, the <coughs> horror of what our life has been these past three months, if, if we can save one family from having to go through this. Andrew ran out of time just needed a little bit more time. And that's really what we're just talking about. We're just talking about a little bit of time. 
Other questions? Thank you both very much. Thank you. And uh, for we appreciate your again. Uh, Ed Cutler is the next witness. It doesn't, Peggy, I don't know that we're going to get to the witnesses on S74, S72, which is the bill I introduced. I'll hold off on that. Let them know if you can. And, um, first off, my condolences to you, too. Um, Appreciate it. We've all lost somebody. Yep. Um, my name is Ed Cutler. I'm the president of Gun Owners of Vermont. Um, first, we would like to commend Senator John Rogers for introducing fixes to the unconstitutional magazine ban. However, we cannot support this bill due to the possibility of Are you dangerous amendments. Which bill is dangerous? As to two, three, you do support two, three, and thirteen. We love the bills. Okay. What we hate is what's probably going to happen in the House. Okay. S fifty five is still very clear in our heads. So. I remember that. Oh, I know you do. Um, so could I just ask you a yep. Are you you're referring here to S one, two, and thirteen, and not S twenty two? Yeah, S22 right. is the waiting period and the safe storage. Yeah, this, well, this is the magazine. You're talking, okay. I, I just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And um, go ahead, yeah. but I, I want. Yeah. <coughs> okay, I think I got it. Okay. Now, um, we love the bills, we really do. And they're but wonderful. You're afraid that even one, two, or 13 passes, they'll get. They'll Add get, two in the other body. They'll get uh, they'll get housed. I guess that's about it. Get housed. Get housed. <laughs> okay. And I I really hate to say it, but just it's a lesson that was hard learned by all of us. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh no, that's that's fine. Okay. Yep. Um. Okay. We are confident that Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs litigation will prevail. Um, so we're asking to put hold on them until a uh, definite uh, court case and we'll see what happens with that. Um, if that happens, the magazine ban disappears completely. So um, we support Federation and we think that's a great idea. Um, I'm overjoyed that they're doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, there has been quite a bit of misinformation put out by Gun Sense Vermont and Moms Demand Action uh, to anti-gun organization, organizations operating within Vermont. The groups are funded by billionaire Michael Bloomberg. According to these groups, Vermont is an extremely dangerous place to live, citing the high, its high firearms homicide rate. Fact, homicide is not murder. According to the FBI Uniform Crime Report, the average firearm murder rate has gone down over the last 20 years in Vermont, now averaging three a year. Homicides including police shootings, self-defense, and accidental shootings are homicides. Vermont has the lowest firearm murder rate in the nation and one of the lowest in the world. For my, okay. Um, I have a link on the election one that you can go to that actually shows the actual um, homicide rates in, in Vermont and how they're actually collated. For instance, in 2012, Vermont Public Radio reported there were seven reported homicides. Breaking them down, two were from police shootings, one was an accidental discharge, another was a defensive use of guns, one originated outside of Vermont, in Crown Point, New York. That only left two actual murders in 2012. Yet the anti-gun organizations continue to mislead by cherry-taking statistics to further their agenda. In 2016, there were reported seven, seven homicides as well. However, 
the actual breakdown shows that two of those were from police shoot. Oh, I'm sorry, I've been there. Okay. okay. Gun Sense is now pushing for a waiting period to purchase firearms in order to accomplish a cooling off period. Fact, in the last two years, 20 years, there have only been three instances of people walking into a gun shop, buying a <coughs> firearm and committing suicide. That's over 20 years. Okay. In one of those instances, the person that did it actually bought a firearm two days before they committed suicide. Fact, a waiting period can be very dangerous. If a woman is being stalked by an abusive husband or any stalker, a waiting period could be the difference between life and death. According to the network, to Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, the most dangerous time, I've got to get new glasses, the most for a victim of uh, domestic violence is when he or she takes steps to leave the relationship. One should not be required to wait two days in order to protect themselves by the best means possible. Fact. You may also need to have a firearm for protection against rabid animals, which are on the increase in Vermont. Just a few months ago, a bobcat attacked two separate people in locations around White River Junction. So rabies is a serious problem in this state. We had a rabies epidemic 15 years ago, and it's, on my fear is it's coming back. Okay. Fact, two-thirds of gun owners own more than one gun. A cooling off period for these gun owners could not possibly have any effect as they already own a other firearms. Antigot antigotal evidence about a person who purchases a firearm and then immediately, immediately uses it to harm themselves or someone else is just that, anecdotal. There is no scientific evidence that waiting periods, no matter the span of time, have any have an effect on suicide. <coughs> waiting periods, as well as newly enacted Act 94 background checks, have and will sabotage a successful program led by the gun owners of Vermont, the, gun, the Vermont Gun Shop Project. And is it called encouraging an individual who is contemplating suicide with a firearm to voluntarily transfer their firearm to a trusted individual. This trusted individual will hold the firearms until the gun owner feels that he or she can safely retake possession of their property. But this program depends on the spur of the moment interaction between the parties. Both waiting periods and background checks have effectively destroyed that interaction. These, are, these interactions are very time sensitive, and you know how much I love this program. Last year, universal background checks were passed into law in no small part by lobbying efforts of Gun Sense Vermont. More than just an invocation and in, inconvenience UBCs have provided proven detrimental to the existing debt to an existing successful suicide prevention program. The gun owners of Vermont and the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen Clubs are leaders encouraging an individual who is con contemplating suicide with, with a firearm to voluntarily transfer that transfer their uh, And we've got it in front of us, so don't worry about it. Okay. You got the gist of it. I've got readers, too, that sometimes don't. Yeah. You know, I mean, I personally have held firearms for three separate individuals. Those people are walking the street now. I've taken a gatekeeper program. I've busted my tail doing this, and dozens of other of our members have done the same. We've cherished this program. 
And to do something like this, I'm sorry, Phil, but to do something like this with this waiting period is a travesty. Could, it, could I ask you, um, the program that you're talking about, yeah. just could you explain specifically how the waiting period or the universal background check just works? I'm holding firearms to one person now, a friend yeah. who was contemplating that. Now, I took those firearms in before the UBC law took effect. The problem now is when I have to give them back, we have to go to an FFL. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because most gun owners are terrified of getting those records. A person who contemplates suicide doesn't want everybody to know what's going on. But you don't have to declare that when you go in. You just, it's just a back of um. <coughs> Sorry, just trying to clarify. No, I understand. Oh. And oh, I was okay. in both no, it's right. If, if you look at your fact, many people, even though suicidal, do not want to relinquish their firearms. Mm -hmm. When reaching out for help, they want them to be stored in a safe place. Now, um, in order to give the trusted person a firearm, they get it back at forty dollars. Ten guns is four hundred dollars. That was. Yeah. Is that your? Uh, that, Literally, so average FFL dealer charges twenty dollars for a transfer. Okay. Okay. I take the gun in; it's a transfer. I give the gun back; it's another transfer. There's forty dollars for one gun. Yeah. Each individual gun <coughs> has to go through a separate transfer. I, I only reacted because you were, as I saw it, you were accusing me of destroying your program. It seems like your program still exists. It's just. There's a fee added and an inconvenience. Yeah, it's in existence, but we can't do anything like this. We can still have that, that bell dealers take the guns in, but most people don't want to do that. And I don't want to. Okay, sure. But okay. I, do, I do want to, given the black's testimony, that there was no sign and that they don't have any animosity or any ill will against the gun shop owner or even the person who sold the gun. To their son, because there was absolutely no sign of the gun shop owner, so there was no way to slow this. I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I'm repeating their testimony, but I think in light of what you're saying, the the project I believe in, but you know, it's not going to work for everyone. Would not have worked for Andrew Black. No, there's it might. Um, it might not work for a number of people, but it is. Like I said, I don't know how many we have. Yeah. Have done, but personally, I've done and helped out. I mean, I, you. I, I, I don't want to say how long I've been here for a quarter of a century. Yeah, I think I have shown support for gun owners sure. throughout that period. But there's one area where I've kind of veered, and that's when there's suicide and, a, and, and domestic violence, but suicide particularly because I see that as Vermont's gun problem. Yep. And so I would love to have from anybody, as well as you, Ed, and anybody else, statistics from other states that have waiting periods and how that's impacted suicide rates by firearm, as well as statistics. The problem is we don't, Congress doesn't allow any studies. So, uh, Actually, they don't do. Know. But anyway, yeah. um, so that sure. would be helpful to all of us. You've got facts here. and I, Expect you've got some statistics. If you can get those to the committee, that would be helpful. Yep, I'll, I'll get Bob to get them. In much nine, I think we're the only state in the country that uh, doesn't read, uh, doesn't keep suicides as right. well. But we know yeah. that roughly ninety percent of the gun-related deaths in Vermont sure. uh, are from suicide. The, the vast majority of the others are related to domestic violence. Yep. Okay. So I would agree with you in your contention that Vermont's not a violent state unless you're the subject of domestic violence or you're contemplating suicide. Well, even with domestic, actually, if we check, check the numbers wow. on that, and the difference between murder and domestic violence, the three a year is 50 50. So, but anyway, okay, Vermont has generated, has generations of parents teaching their children how to handle all kinds of firearms for the purpose of hunting, target shooting, and personal safety. It is a Vermont tradition 
We need to continue this tradition instead of installing fear in our kids by marketing firearms as a scary object. Never to be handled. The next generation of young Vermonters should continue to be schooled in the proper handle and safe use of firearms. Not to be taught fear and loathing of an inanimate object that could very well save their lives. Our young, Vermont, our young Vermonters need the opportunity to have the choice of and use of firearms as a positive ideal and not to be brainwashed into believing otherwise. Um, one other thing, I did send two emails, one last night and one this morning. The one this morning is came, I pulled off of our website. It has the CDC data on suicides and murders. I think it's just what you were asking for. So. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking at both of these, and I appreciate your concern about Housing, I love that word, and I will use it. We'll use it frequently because there's a lot of other bills that get housed. Oh yeah. Well. All right. Are I, there any other questions, of Ed? Ed, thank you very much for making the trip up. Sure. I appreciate it. Uh, Bill Moore, Vermont Traditions Coalition <coughs> Policy Analyst. Uh, I couldn't see. Anybody's having trouble with his glasses this morning? I know that feeling. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to try to get to Dr. Bell, so I may skip around a little bit. I was going to say, if Dr. Versardi's driven all the way up. Well, he's not. No. He's by phone. His phone, uh, I emailed him. I haven't okay. heard back. So, uh, Wait my time. He yeah, he's just in the emergency room. No, actually. He's treated me in the emergency room, so I have a lot of confidence in him, and I'm glad he's there and not here. I've looked him up. He seems like a yeah, he's very confident. confident and, uh, guy. He's, he's a good man, um, so I, uh, I'm sure he would not mind me. So I appreciate. Uh, my name is Will, uh, William Moore, um, the firearm policy analyst for Vermont Traditions Coalition. <coughs> I'm also representing the Green Mountain Boys Shooting Club and the Vermont Military History Museum, LLC, which is located at the Green Mountain Boys Shooting Club. Sometimes we need to talk about the cannon, but other than that. Uh, <laughs> did you hear it? No. Anyway, so I have separated my testimony. You have one paper copy of the <coughs> testimony on 22 and 72. Uh, I misprinted the other, so I'll, I'm reading that now. Okay. Um, and in this testimony, um, I also, as I said, represent the Green Mountain Boys Shooting Club and the Vermont Hill Military History Museum. The, these Lamoille County groups are comprised of over 450 annual dues-paying members and have held a variety of shooting and historical events since 1999. The largest is a July event attracting 300 to 400 participants with between 1,500 and 2,000 spectators. That event also features food vendors, and in the interest of safety, we hire the Lamoille Ambulance Service, which provides an on-site ambulance with EMT team during operating hours. The multiplier of economic effects of similar events is well documented and a great help to this local economy. Plans to construct a military museum and events building at the site were placed on hold last year following the passage of the large capacity magazine van, and reservations for the summer events have stalled due to the large out-of-state attendees being uncertain about their legal situation. <coughs> Pardon me. Many acquisitions of small items and large equipment were planned for the museum, including vehicles from World War I, II, Korea, and Vietnam, which may have included some magazines and belt feeding devices affected by the ban. Obviously, we support the, uh, the lawsuits question before the court, and we look for them to in the next couple months give us some clarity on that. Um, we are not a party to the suit, by the way. I'm not uh, listed as a party. While not all our events are competitive in nature, the museum and club shooting ranges have also been used for training and educational components, including the historical display of vehicles and weaponry at our summer events. Most recently, the local Boy Scout camp has been using our range for off-site hunter education 
and shooting safety classes for youth from all over New England. Without the fundraising capabilities of these and yet to be imagined associated with the club and the Vermont Military History Museum, most of these events will likely cease and the club may have to close, foregoing any future opportunities for the site to host safe and economically robust activities. I've spoken to Senator Rogers, and we would like to ask that his bill uh, regarding the ability for uh, people to come and go to Vermont with legally owned magazines. Um, that we've asked that we include, quote, historical and educational events, along with, quote, established shooting competitions, which is already in the bill. While this not, will not facilitate our ability to pursue acquisitions for the museum that would violate 13 VSA, otherwise it would allow for the free and predictable scheduling of future events that are literally the lifeblood of this important community organization. Um, so I am going to switch to um, testimony that is regarding um, 22 and 72 if um, anyone wants to have questions on those on that subject first um, be happy to hear those we do support uh, all three of Senator Rogers bills and to be clear uh, he is back uh, to be clear uh, we support those bills um, with the reservation that they you know they're pretty clear simple remedies um, and that they not be uh, um, used for other purposes as they move through the building um, on the uh, we're we're opposed to the use of a waiting period for reasons that I'll outline in this testimony um, and my main concern with it is that there are people who are not meant to be the target of a waiting period who will be prevented from acquiring a weapon and it, that they can use for home defense um, in a crisis situation. You can use your imagination as to who those people might be. Um, the, uh, the reporting of, uh, of activities under the new ERPO statute is something we would support. Um, having accurate records of those and an ongoing uh, record of how those are applied by the courts and what those outcomes would be is something we would support. Um, the safe storage is written in such a way that I think uh, it lends itself to inadvertent accidental violation by people who are meaning to use and have available at their disposal their firearms in their homes for self-defense. So just so we're on the record on all those bills. So uh, I, I will be uh, furthering um, documents, testimony, some of it from the Senate Education, as a matter of fact, um, to be posted and for you to consider as you um, review particularly the waiting period. Um, so uh, please accept my gratitude for this opportunity on behalf of Vermont Traditions Coalitions. Um, as you know, we represent a broad coalition from snowmobilers to forest landowners and the hunting, fishing, and trapping communities. In this meeting, we're asked to focus on a broad list of bills with varied goals and different policy goals. I will not be testifying in detail regarding these two bills, as may be expected. One concerns the emergency risk protection orders and proper judicial application in domestic violence cases, and the other is a straightforward proposal for new restrictions on the lawful purchase and private home possession of firearms. Instead, I will provide detailed, authentic research and testimony of others and sourced from public arenas, including testimony, testimony from other committees here in this building. Some are related to disruptions experienced by teachers in Vermont schools. Some from practitioners of restorative program in, programs in school systems here in Vermont. Another area I will provide documents will be in the larger picture of suicidal behavior and prevention. I'm not an expert. I spent my time not looking at uh, gun rights organizations statements on waiting periods. I went to the people who talk about suicide prevention all the time. And I would highly recommend the Vermont uh, Suicide Prevention Council's website. Following my, my research, some observations follow. I suggest you read these documents that I will forward to see if my observations are valid. In testimony before the Senate Education Committee, teachers and other professionals have detailed experience and professional recommendation at dealing with precursor behavior to all types of youth violence, including suicide. Reporting collaborative peer-to-peer -peer restorative practice 
and stronger social and psychological intervention are all suggested, as well as the need for more robust social services and mental health crisis intervention systems in the schools and the larger community. Also striking in my research is the consensus in the mental health and emergency medical community regarding the identification, intervention, and response to behaviors and actions that provide diagnostic clues to the dangers of suicidal or other violent behaviors in individuals. These sometimes include a statement regarding firearms in the home or possession by the individual. Other means such as pharmaceuticals are not quantified separately in the articles I reviewed. Perhaps they should be. What is striking is that the availability of firearms or other means are way down the list of indicators or actions that suggest a clinical response is likely to be successful. Rather, the response in the form of friends, family, and colleagues in love, kindness, understanding, listening, and offering help in accessing resources is always stressed through these papers. <coughs> Professional clinical treatment and rehabilitation can rarely succeed except it follows these. These bills do not appear to follow these professional advisory and do not address the paucity of clinical and professional availability in Vermont and our schools. Those <laughs> solutions do not really even fall within the purview of this committee in many cases. All of us in the firearms owning community stand ready to assist in strengthening any means to these ends that will be successful. As the testimony regarding the proposals has yet to be heard by the committee in support of in particular the background or the uh, waiting period uh, uh, proposal. I wish to return and be able to respond to that testimony. Without supporting statements from professionals regarding these proposals, I'm not yet prepared to refute or assent to their positions on the need for these remedies. And please allow me to read from a short dialogue in one of the Vermont Suicide Prevention Council's website pages by Professor Thomas Delaney, <coughs> UVM Larner's College of Medicine. Uh, he was recently on VPR, if you heard the program. He was one of the speakers who was very articulate. And he takes a uh, sort of a myth and fact approach in one of his, uh, his letters or one of his articles. And one of those is, and I'm reading it in full, I'm not cherry picking parts of it. Uh, he has misconception. Suicide attempts are really just about people feeling sad and hopeless. Reality. Most people who die by suicide have an underlying mental health condition such as depression, anxiety disorder, substance abuse disorder, or personality disorder. Other suicide risk factors include increased use of alcohol and other drugs, feelings of anxiety, agitation and recklessness, sleeping too little or too much, feeling isolated or withdrawn from others or displaying extreme mood swings. Signs of a depressive disorder include irritability, lack of energy, change in dietary habits, changes in appearance, restlessness, and changes in activities that a person once found pleasurable. A strong emphasis on building skills for redirecting, thinking, coping, help-seeking, self-care, and communication has been shown to be effective for treating risk factors for suicide. I come from a family of survivors. <clears throat> My mother was raped by her brother at 10 years old. It changed her whole life. She was late, too late in life for her to really uh, enjoy the benefits of pop proper clinical attention. Um, she was finally diagnosed in, in her, her last years as having bipolar and exhibiting deep depression related to her bipolar disorder, um, partly organic, partly caused by post-traumatic stress. The rest of the family has a mixed result of alcohol, depression, addiction, and so on. This is something you survive. It isn't something that the law, strictly speaking, can address. Um, I'm certainly more of a benefit sitting here before you today by the people in my family, my friends, my church, than any law proposed in any of these bills. I'm sitting here sober and, and, and relatively calm and happy and able to function in life uh, in spite of the law um, because uh, where the law can help is the areas that I've been discussing. And you need to go to the professionals. I don't believe the waiting period is an effective tool. Uh, I think it will 
it will disrupt, perhaps, as Eddie said, it may disrupt relationships where this gun shop project can also function uh, in this. Um, but more to the point, it may just, it may create a disruption for people who need to access a firearm because of a true threat. And so to you, I would say, uh, look for other areas, for other solutions, and perhaps they aren't even something that this committee will be able to address. I think they're expensive and they're complicated, but they do require one thing, and that is relationships. One thing is, I better leave that for now. Well, I was about to say that one thing the state hasn't been very adept at is dealing with our mental health problem in this since it's Hurricane Irene, particularly, and it's a particular problem that I've been trying to deal with. I just think um, <coughs> two governors, two different groups of legislators have not adequately addressed that problem in the state, and it's uh, you know it's seen in our emergency rooms now. And, <coughs> seeing wherever we are. And I'm not suggesting that uh, the, uh, these bills are related to that, but to, in terms of mental health issues in the state, uh, are, we're not addressing the real problems. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Bersati uh, and also from, um, if you can get Mr. Delaney in, I think that'd be an excellent, oh, okay. excellent way we'll to We'll do the best we can with the time we got. Senator White. I just, um, one of the um, things that's kind of floating around the building that I've heard from, um, primarily from gun owners, is the um, kind of a compromise that would have first time gun owners have a waiting period. The problem with that is how do you prove that you're a first time, or that you already have a gun, but, but is, if, if that could be done, that might, um, for people who already own a gun, they're, if they want to um, do something with it, they're going to, they already have the gun. But for first time gun owners, is that something that seems doable or workable or so, affordable? Yeah, I've heard several ideas along those lines. Um, unfortunately, most of them lead to something that looks and smells like a list. Yeah. And that is what probably you've been told as well. It's, um, as I think as Ed pointed out, one of the things about the next background check system is that uh, the perception of lawful gun owners is that it creates a sort of a list. Mm -hmm. um, while they don't mind the background check itself, um, it's the paper trail that uh, sticks under some of the crop. Um, having said that, I have some ideas as to how you would flip that thing on its head and be able to allow people um, to uh, somehow deal with that problem without a list. Uh, but I think it's too, it would be premature for me to <coughs> discuss that at this time. I, again, I want to reiterate that if you're doing a load of laundry and you, you have a, a, a dry line outside that's this long and you've got 40 pieces to put up, and you put one up and wait for it to dry, and then you put another one and wait for it to dry. You're not making any progress. You're really not getting at the bigger problem. And the waiting period is a very little tiny pinprick at the problem. And it may have unintended consequences against people who you definitely don't want to address, people who really have a need. Um, you'll probably also hear mention, and I'd like to hear from the FFLs of the inconvenience and the, and the difficulty for their sales, but I think that's not at the top of my list of concern. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Appreciate the testimony. I'll wait. I know you'll be with us. All right, go on. I'm going to do my best to get to everybody today, but uh, if I can, uh, we will meet on this again when we get back from the town meeting break. Um, uh, Dr. Bell, if you would mind joining us.
Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so my name's Rebecca Bell. I'm a pediatric. That oh, this one. Sorry. sorry. One okay. Too many microphones. I'm not used to it. Um, so I'm a pediatric critical care physician. I work at the University of Vermont uh, Medical Center in the pediatric intensive care unit. Um, we are the only um, PICU, as it's called, in um, in uh, the state That's of Vermont. The VPR okay. That's what gets I'm just, we need to okay. we need to put a VPR on it so that they know. Um, I'm also. Um, Relevant to this discussion, I sit on the Vermont State Child Fatality Review Team. So we review all unexpected child fatalities under the age of 18. Um, I'm here representing the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We represent 200 Vermont pediatricians um, and the Vermont Medical Society representing 2,000 Vermont physicians in support of S22. So we support a waiting period and we support safe storage of firearms. Um, so I, I wanted to start first by um, quickly presenting the problem and what we can do and what the evidence shows we can do about this problem. So to start, I have two maps of um, CDC data of suicide rates in the in the U.S. One one is an overall rate. One is um, just 18 years old and, and younger. And, and they're, they're very similar, but this is over the last 10 years that we have data for, and it shows that Vermont stands out both for the overall suicide rate and in particular for, for youth suicide rate. Um, so we consistently have the highest youth suicide rate in our region. Um, and one of the questions, of course, is why? Why do we share borders with other states that have much lower rates of youth suicide? Um, and the first thing um, you know we think about is is mental health, right? So um, there was a paper that came out um, actually in January of 2019 looking at this. So researchers took um, youth suicide rates, and then they looked at youth reported symptoms that you would think would be closely correlated with with death rates. Um, so all high school students across the country fill out an anonymous survey every other year called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So almost all Vermont high school students fill this out. And they look at a bunch of different things, um, but the researchers pulled out three, three questions that are relevant. Um, youth reported severe depressive symptoms, and they describe what those are in the last year. Um, Youth reported suicidal planning. Have you made a plan to attempt suicide in the last year? And actual suicide attempt rates. So have you attempted suicide in the last year? Those numbers in, to give you a, a broad perspective, in Vermont and elsewhere over the last 10 years has risen. Um, we have not, we're not back to where we were in the, in the late 90s. The numbers were worse in the 90s. They kind of came down. And then the last 10 years have been and trending up again. Um, the, the last few youth risk behavior studies, actually in Vermont, we've stayed pretty steady. We haven't continued to increase. So that's a cautiously optimistic sign, but certainly I work with patients who deal with this stuff, and this is a problem that you know we're dealing with. When we compare Vermont rates of those things to other states, we have some of the lowest numbers in the country. So this study that came out in January of 2019 looked at over the period of 10 years, Vermont had the lowest suicide attempt rate among young people, one of the lowest suicidal planning among young people, and one of the lowest reported symptoms of depression. Yet, they are dying. And so the researchers looking at this said, why? Why, why are there some states like Vermont and there are other states um, similar to us um, where our, our reported <coughs> mental health issues that we think would be very closely correlated don't predict our death rates as much. And what they found, what, what was more, a more predictive factor were states that had high gun ownership. So actually, and if you look at the, at the map, you can kind of predict that, right? So which states have the highest death rates? They are states that have high gun ownership. They're also rural, right? Yep. Yep, right. They go, they, those, two, those two things tend to go hand in hand, yes. Um, and 
So the issue we have is the lethality of the method used. So although our young people are attempting at a lower rate, they're dying at a higher rate because the method that they're choosing is more lethal. Um, in Vermont and all across the country, the most common, um, commonly used method um, in suicide deaths are firearms. Um, our overall population, it's about 56% in Vermont for the general population. Um, and for our young people 18 years and younger, about half of our young people who are dying by suicide do so by firearm. Um, and so when you compare the variability among states, it's really the, the extra firearm use that ends up bringing, driving our numbers. So the, the firearm piece tends to create the variability between the states. So more so than um, at a state level reported mental health issues. So that's at the state level and at the individual level, we find a similar pattern. So young people that die by suicide um, tend to actually have a history of impulsivity, much more so than a history of mental health issues or a history of depression. So looking at those, those individuals at an individual level and a state level, the presence of the firearm, the use of the firearm is much more predictive than other pieces, although they all sort of contribute. Um, so then, then the next question is, is there something we can do about it, and, and should we? Um, and that's sort of where we go into what does it look like for people who, young people who attempt suicide. Now, I'm talking about young people because that's the population that I work with. I work in the pediatric ICU. I take care of, um, of young people who've attempted suicide, um, usually by other means other than firearms. Those in this state who use firearms don't make it to my ICU. Um, they, you know, this, these, this is an immediately fatal method. Um, the difference between those who choose firearms or something else very lethal and those who choose, say, an ingestion, um, actually those who choose ingestion tend to be planning the suicide a little bit longer. They tend to be a little bit more depressed than those What's who use firearms. Injection? Oh, ingestion. Inge like a oh, poisoning I'm sorry. Or, or, you know, oh, okay. pills. I'm yep. sorry, I misunderstood nope. the term. No problem. Um, uh, but regardless, people do this impulsively. Young people do this impulsively. And I, I know you have a lot of testimony every year. I came before the commit, this committee last year, and I told the story of, in general, the patients that I see um, and the impulsivity and the temporary crisis that they're going into that leads to their suicide attempt. And I can only speak in in general terms, I can't tell the stories of my patients. I can't tell the stories of the child fatalities that we review in our team. But I can tell you that they are the story of Andrew Black. And hearing his parents tell his story, this is not just, this is not a unique tragedy. This is a story of Vermont. This is, this is what I hear when I talk to my patients who have survived a suicide attempt and I ask them, what happened? And what you don't hear is a story of an inevitable outcome. What you hear is something happened, I got in a fight with my friend, my girlfriend broke up with me, I got in a fight with my parents, I was really, really upset, I was feeling pain and I wanted the pain to end. And it doesn't make sense, but a lot of these young people don't really want to die, if that makes sense, they want the pain to go away. And when they choose a less lethal method, I have a lot of stuff in my ICU that I can do to help them. I work with an amazing team, and when we help a young person get through a suicide attempt and survive that, we feel really good about that. Because we know that people who survive serious suicide attempts, 90% of them go on to live and don't die by suicide. So this is not an inevitable outcome. This is a temporary, usually a response to a temporary crisis, to a lot of pain. And if they choose something that then, as soon as they do it, they regret it, they call for help, we can do something to help them. I cannot do something for people who choose to use a firearm. I can't. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, the Black family used the phrase acute adjustment reaction. 
Um, <coughs> that may be a, a different clinical description for something similar to what you're talking about. Um, do you have anything to add on, on that? Is that the kind of thing you're speaking of? I'm speaking of that and, uh, you know, I even, the stories that I hear are even oftentimes shorter than Andrew's stories and what his parents described. I hear, uh, I saw this post on social media. I hear my parents took my cell phone away. Um, I hear I got, was on the phone with my boyfriend. My boyfriend broke up with me, and I got really upset. So, so I even hear shorter, a sh like a shorter period, and not even uh, you know I'm in a dark place for two days. It's I was really upset five minutes ago, and then I did this. Um, I, you know, I've had people attempt suicide in the midst of having an argument, you know, actually arguing with their parents. You've never had someone who attempted suicide with a firearm who you could say, is that? That is I, that, yeah. I'm just trying to make clear that's your testimony, that yes. once a person used a firearm, it's, it's fatal and uh, there's no... In my career, I have taken care of a patient who did attempt suicide with a firearm, who I took care of a year afterwards, who was coming in for massive reconstructive surgery. Um, so, she, so this person had survived, um, but had incredible morbidity, as you can imagine. Um, yes, these are, I take care of. I, mean, yeah. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, yeah. but what you're basically saying is someone who tries to ingest pills, yes. cuts their wrists, yes. other methods are not necessarily fatal, but that by and large, firearms are fatal because of their uh, lethality. That's right, yes. Okay. Yep, they're very lethal. Um, and, and the difference between the, someone who chooses a firearm and someone who chooses pills, yep. there's not much difference. A lot of times we think if they chose a firearm, they really, really were intent on dying but we actually find the opposite is true. If anything, both both do so impulsively. If anything, those who choose a non-firearm tend to actually have been planning it for a little bit longer. In your, you know, seeing how you obviously talk to colleagues in other states, is this true in other jurisdictions as well, where the firearm is very difficult for either an emergency room physician or yourself? Yes, to yes, yes, and if you just look at suicide deaths, just across the country of any age group, the most common method is a firearm. It's the most lethal. It's the most lethal method, yeah. Yep. Um, I did buy a way to ensure a physician. I had okay. a procedure okay. yesterday. Okay. I'm not, it's not against you. You're not causing this. Okay, great. And, um, now physicians don't provide the same level of painkillers that they That's used true. to provide because That's true. of this legislature yes. and other groups, which is a good thing. But, um, we use ice. Ice is actually great. <laughs> it's a great thing. I just wanted to explain that so you don't feel like I'm, um, it's not your testimony. Yes. Um, when, when researchers talk to young people, and that includes up to age 35, um, and who have survived near fatal suicide attempts and talk to them about what, what's that time period between when you thought you wanted to, you were going to attempt suicide and when you didn't, about a quarter said less than five minutes. Uh, an additional 50% said less than an hour, and then some other percentage less than a day. So that age group up to, you know, it's like 15 to 35 year old age group, that time period is very, very short. Um, and then both this waiting period and the safe storage for me really combine um, to address some of this impulsivity and suicide among young people in Vermont. So although we raise the minimum age to purchase firearms in this state, there are some excep exceptions if you have taken a course. Um, so a waiting period still um, affects my patient population potentially. And then the safe storage piece, um, in addition, that's generally how um, young people in the state die by firearm suicide. It's, it's a non-unsecured firearm in the home. Um, we do know that, that storing the firearm in a locked container, storing it unloaded, and the ammunition stored separately, each, each one of those practices independently reduces the risk. To get all together, they really reduce the risk of a child, a young person 
um, using the firearm either in an unintentional shooting or, or a suicide. Um, so as part of, part of what we do as pediatricians is, is we talk about this, we counsel families, there's a lot of work being done on how, to, how, how can we best get the message out there, how can we do so in a way that um, you know, isn't threatening to families but provides education about how to safely store firearms, um, working on providing this type of safe storage equipment to families so it's easy, talking, having families talk to each other when their kids go over to other homes, are your, are your firearms safely stored? This is all part of improving this, but the safe storage bill is one part of that. I appreciate that. that. Yep. I just want to, um, it's currently written, I'm not sure how you would enforce a safe storage law. Yep. I, mean, I yep. don't think many people would disagree that safe storage is a good idea. I just don't know how you enforce what's happening in somebody's home and how they're taking care of their firearms until an incident occurred. Yeah. So I, 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 that's one of my, you know, as we, as Senate Judiciary, we have to write, we believe we need to write laws that you can enforce. Yeah. And uh, that was, that's one. Because I know that the Department of Mental Health, I believe, and maybe the Vermont Medical Society, I'm not sure how this works, but I know there is a program that uh, distributes um, <laughs> some lock boxes or blocks or whatever they are. Has that made any difference at all, do you think? Oh, um, well, I, I think that's, that's a really tough thing to, to measure. Um, in terms of just um, safe storage, all, all law enforcement um, um, offices have, for instance, uh, tr uh, cable locks, which are not, you know, the, the best way to secure, but people can get those for free. Some places, like you mentioned, um, the medical center, the Howard Center, <coughs> give out lock boxes mm -hmm. that could be could use for an, for a handgun. It's not done in um, a way that we can really study. I guess it's sort of just a little bit haphazard yeah. be done. Um, I, we do know, you know, part of it is talking about it and getting the message out there. We know that the behavior of safe storage makes a big difference, and we're trying to figure out what the best way is to encourage that. Um, I think part of it might be the education um, and the PR around a safe storage law so that people know about it. Um, but certainly, that's only a very small part of it, and the rest of it has to be us as a society talking about it to each other and us talking about it to families about, about safe storage. I think that's a big, a big part of it. And none of these, none of this stuff is going to fix everything, of course. But I think, you know, I, I I work a lot on how do we count, how do what are the words we use with families to talk about safe storage? It's a touchy subject for some people. That's really really important. I think yes, legislating it is going to be hard. But I think that some of the education and, and PR around it could could change the way some people store their firearms. It's a hard thing to measure. The studies that I've seen have talked about somewhere in the single digit percent decrease in suicide among young people, like eight to 10%. Um, yeah, I, we don't need to get into that, how okay. we write the bill today, but <coughs> something that I'm uh, aware of. Other questions for Dr. Bell? Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it, and uh, we call on you for further information. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, Chris, you want to hand a copy of the bill? Oh, hand out. Uh, from the Vermont Federation of Sports Clubs, Chris, thank you for being here. Our time is short. I, I hope you can do it in 10 minutes. Uh, uh, How you 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 between a prestigious Senate panel and lunch? Yes. Well, I'll just watch the meeting. Very good. Thank you. For the record, my name is Chris Bradley. Uh, I'm the president of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. Thank you for providing me an opportunity uh, to speak before this committee. For any of you who do not know about the Federation, we are an organization that traces its roots back to, in Vermont, back to 1875. We are, in essence, an association of clubs. The Federation is an umbrella organization that represents over 50 sporting clubs across the great state of Vermont, with those clubs representing tens of thousands of Vermonters. In the packet of information I've provided, there are individual statements concerning S1, 2, and 13, 
As I perceive my time to give testimony will be limited by necessity, I will state that the Federation fully supports all three of those bills as they correct several oversights that resulted from the rather unsettling speed with which things were pushed through the House last year. I felt that issuing a strong statement of support for S1, 2, and 13 are adequate, and given my time constraint, I will therefore devote the rest of my time to addressing S22. <coughs> Regarding S22 and the general topic of suicide, the Federation is unequivocal. Suicide is a tragedy which has touched just about everyone. The Federation, all of its members, and most likely everyone here today deeply values human life. Too many of us know the boundless sorrow that results when somebody takes their own life. I personally understand the profound sense of loss in the wake of suicide, as I have lost a beloved uncle and lost a very dear close friend to suicide, and both chose to ensure that their lives were ended by using a firearm. The death of my friend was especially reflective to me. It is the Federation's understanding that the primary impetus for the consideration of bills that will enact a waiting period on the purchase of a firearm is to address suicide. And we believe it is an honest attempt to prevent similar tragedies in the future. We therefore fully understand and appreciate the intent. It is, in effect, an effort to save someone from themselves. We understand the role that firearms can play in suicide. And even though firearms are only used in approximately 1% of suicide attempts, we understand that when a firearm is used, it is usually lethal. Our understanding of the relationship between people in jeopardy, firearms, and suicide is why the Federation took the lead, along with the gun owners of Vermont, in establishing a Vermont version of the New Hampshire Gun Shop Project. We became aware of this as a result of obtaining, reading, and then embracing a document authored by the Vermont Center of Health and Learning under a grant supplied by the Vermont Department of Mental Health entitled Reducing Suicide Risk by Limiting Access to Lethal Means. In taking on that lead role, the Federation worked hard to develop handouts, posters, and related materials, and we then made that material available to our clubs and FFLs. We did this completely voluntarily. We tackled that project on a complete volunteer basis with the intent of raising awareness by providing what to look for, tips on how to approach an individual in jeopardy, tips on questions to ask, and other existing resources that sportsmen, sportswomen, sporting clubs, and FFLs might use to help prevent such tragedies. Examples are in the packet. And while most are logoed by the SPC, the Federation and Gun Owners of Vermont created the content. When S-22 was released, we embraced the challenge to see if there was something further we might contribute. After reviewing what had been done and what existed, we sat down and mapped out the framework for a reporting system that could provide a simple yet effective method that had the potential of being far more effective at stopping suicides than a waiting period. And we did that by completely focusing on how such a system would work, not the reasons why it couldn't work. Immediately after mapping, and you see uh, my document there, uh, uh, suicide prevention system. Immediately after mapping out those systems might, might look like, we ran squarely into a wall of privacy rights. We ran into the very real possibility that the creation of a well-intentioned database of people of concern could be misused and even abused. And of course, we ran into issues of due process. Should you be interested, I have included my write-up on the systems we envisioned in my packet. While the Federation would have concerns over how such, such a system is implemented, I believe the medical community and others would likely step in rather heavily and oppose such systems due to the issue of privacy rights, despite there being several HIPAA exemptions to reporting people at risk, as was outlined by legal counsel earlier this week. To specifically address the two components of S22, I will first address the second part, safe storage. As far as this portion is concerned, we fully believe that a safe storage scheme was fully addressed by the Supreme Court of the United States in the DC versus Heller decision. We believe that this will be impossible to enforce we believe this will negatively impact the ability to defend one's home, and we believe that this 
bill creates bizarre situations where a person is in violation by simply leaving the bedroom in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. We oppose this portion. <coughs> Regarding the waiting period portion, we offer the following points. One, right to self-defense versus an attempt to save a life. In considering this bill, we see a problem in attempting to achieve a balance between an individual's constitutional right of self-defense versus the establishment of a waiting period that might possibly delay a person from committing suicide. According to the Vermont Judiciary Annual Statistical Report for 2018, there were 3,380 relief from abuse filings in 2018, which was an increase of 8% from 2017. For those RFA filings, which become court orders, these cases represent situations where a victim is able to convince a court that they are under a real threat of bodily injury or even death threats from another, such that the court will issue an order to keep the party separated. In these situations, a victim has been able to prove they live under some unacceptable level of risk of injury or even death, and we believe it likely that some of these victims may well want to take the prudent step of obtaining the means of self-defense to preserve their own life. Even if there is only one victim that wishes to purchase the means to defend themselves, is it reasonable, fair, and constitutional to subject that victim to any waiting period when any delay might well make the difference between saving their own life or preventing injury? How do we balance the rights of a person who wishes to preserve their life versus a person who is intent on ending theirs. Two, people who already own firearms. Um, in many cases, when a person owns a gun and they want to buy a firearm, they will typically use the same FFL. This is, is certainly not always the case, but generally speaking, it is. In a situation where an FFL, who, by the way, by federal law, has to keep a bound book of all his transactions, knows that the purchaser already owns a firearm, what purpose is served by delaying the possession? Number three, people plan. It is the Federation's view that the establishment of an arbitrary time limit, and I say arbitrary because we have a 48 and a 72 hour floating out there, will not work for the simple reason that people plan. And we have seen this time and time again. Whatever the time period imposed, this cannot and will not guarantee the person involved will be stopped from attempting to take their own life. As an aside here, I did a quick search uh, of the legislature um, bills in play looking for mental health. What we need is a statewide level of awareness raising for the issue that is suicide. We need to raise the level of awareness of people who are in jeopardy. Where is that bill? <coughs> A person, and as another consideration, I believe there is credence to the thought that when the suicidal person attempts to buy a firearm and is then told that they cannot take immediate possession due to an arbitrary waiting period, that delay may well be seen by them as yet another injustice, heaped upon them to add to their already perceived misery, thereby making them even more resolute. For, and perhaps most okay. important, if I, and I'm really embarrassed to do this, but I know what happens here is this room gets divided up and we were lucky to get it for two hours and there's gonna be another group storming in on us as we speak. I wonder if you'd be able to come back and finish your testimony. I would love to. Your date. I hate to do that to you. Uh, if we were in our own committee room, we would finish. Um, and I, I just, but I know what will happen here. We'll have people planning on some kind of meeting, um, uh, storming in. And, and Senators, I, 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 uh, may I have the latitude to resubmit? Yeah. Yes, you may. And I, I appreciate do. that. Um, and uh, we will hear from you first up, and then Carrie, and then the people on S72 uh, when we get back after the town meeting. Thank you very much, Senator. I perfectly understand. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I also appreciate your effort to try to find. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you.